planting a seed, germinating the row, tending to the crop, and harvesting the bounty. The cycle of growing a carrot in your garden. That order of operations, while unique and nuanced, is roughly the same for everything we grow. It all seems so simplified when you break it down to fast-paced videos that cover a month's or even a year's worth of growth into just a few minutes. But really, gardening is this journey that has to be enjoyed. A process of learning where we absorb all the knowledge that we can as we go along. I recently made a four-part series on growing your first garden. A deep dive into everything you need to think about when you're just starting out. What I've done here is compiled all four videos into one place so you don't have to go looking for them. From tiny unassuming seeds to literal forests of harvest. So pull up a chair, grab something nice to drink, and enjoy. I wish you all the success this year. So you've decided to grow your first garden. What could be more exciting? But even as I hear myself say those words, I realize that for some, that could be a daunting thought. Where to start? When to start? What to grow? And how to grow it? So many questions. And even after a rudimentary search, it seems like there's even more answers. Confusing to say the least, especially if you're just starting out. But once you get into it, really get your hands in the dirt and buy into the idea of growing your own food, you'll quickly see that it's not nearly as difficult as it seems. Sure, there's going to be setbacks, even for the most veteran grower. But the bounty you receive will outweigh the disappointment a hundredfold. And while for many of us, the weather looks a lot like this outside, making gardening seem like a far-off venture. But in reality, growing a successful garden is all about planning ahead. So it may not seem like it because of the weather outside, but the beginning of a new year is actually the perfect time to think about starting that first garden. Seasoned growers are already starting their seeds indoors and prepping the beds that aren't under a foot of snow. But don't worry, the days are early and we'll get there. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. And in this four part beginner gardening series, we'll go over everything that you need to know to make your first garden a successful one. Soil, nutrients, pH, watering, location, plant selection, all of it. And it starts right now. Hey, before we get into the plants and even the seeds themselves, it would make sense to create a baseline of knowledge to help us get started. Take away some of that mystery of growing a garden for the first time to give us the best chance at initial success. And we can do this by covering the three T's of gardening. Terms, tools, and timing. Let's look at some common gardening terms to make sure that we can speak the language. Aeration. Describes the methods used to loosen soil and create air gaps necessary for plant roots. Allium. A group of common crops including garlic, green onions, onions, and scallions. Amendments. Nutrient or functional additions to the soil to improve its structure and or fertility. Annual. A group of plants who complete their entire life cycle within a year. Axle. The angle between the upper side of a leaf or side stem and the main vertical trunk. Beneficial insects. Insects that help your garden in two ways. One, they act as pollinators for our flowering plants. And two, they prey upon the bad insects that are harmful or damage our crops. Biennial. A group of plants who complete their entire life cycle within two years with vegetative growth in the first and flowering in the second. Cation exchange capacity. It's the direct measure of how many nutrients your soil can hold onto over time, with clay soils being the highest and sandy soils being the least. Chlorosis. Yellowing of the leaves and stems, usually due to a lack of nutrition. Companion planting. The practice of growing different crops in close proximity 
for their mutual benefit. Compost. The decomposing plant and kitchen waste used to enrich the top layers of our soil after it's been broken down. Container gardening. A style of growing exclusively in pots and containers, usually on a patio or deck, in the absence of arable land. Cover crops. Quick growing plants used to combat erosion and bare soil, usually during the dormant seasons. Crop rotation. The practice of planting and growing different crops in a specified area to optimize nutrients and prevent pest and weed buildup. Damping off. A disease caused by pathogens and funguses that affects seedlings soon after they germinate. This causes stem and root rot and eventually death. Direct seeding. Method of planting whereby the seeds are planted directly into your garden or raised bed rather than germinated indoors and then transplanted. Drainage. Refers to your soil's ability to shed excess water, whether it's in the ground, in a raised bed, or in a container. Exposure. The amount of sunshine an area receives in a given day denoted as full sun, partial sun, partial shade, or full shade. Fertilizer. Any material, natural or synthetic, that provides essential elements, compounds, and nutrients for the plants to use. Foliar feeding. A method of feeding plants through their leaves rather than the traditional method that uses their roots. Frost dates. Two specific dates in temperate regions, noting the last day of frost in the spring and the first day of frost in the fall. Germination. The sprouting of a plant for the first time from a dormant seed. Hardening off. The process of acclimating indoor plants to the infinitely harsher conditions of outside regarding temperature, wind, and exposure. Hardiness zone. Geographic areas categorized by their minimum annual winter temperatures. Micronutrients. Elements and minerals needed by plants in small amounts to complete their life functions and to stay healthy. Mulch. A layer of material, usually organic, applied to the surface of the soil to protect it from water loss, exposure, temperature extremes, and to suppress weeds. Nodes. Area on a stem or trunk of a plant where the leaf or a side branch appear. The areas between the nodes are called internodes. No-till. A style of farming where the soil is left alone and rarely disturbed other than to harvest. Preservation of the soil integrity is the ultimate goal. NPK. An acronym for the three main macronutrients plants need to live. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Perennial. A group of plants whose life cycle takes three or more years to complete. Pests. Invasive animals who eat and damage crops when their numbers aren't kept in check. They can be native or non-native. pH. A measuring scale of the relative acidity or alkalinity in the soil, with neutral being a 7. Anything below being acidic and anything above being alkaline. Pruning. A method of cutting back plants to either clean them up or control excess growth. Rhizome. Horizontal underground plant stems capable of producing roots or shoots to establish brand new plants. Root bound. Condition of a plant, usually in a container, where the roots have taken over every inch of space and they can't go anywhere else. Root rot. Condition affecting the roots of a plant either by being too wet with too little oxygen or by pathogens and disease. Runner. Long stem-like growth protruding from a mother plant that once established can break away from the main plant, growing into a completely new one, such as strawberries. Soil, the lifeblood and growing medium of any farm made of five ingredients. Minerals, organic matter, living organisms, water, and air. Spacing, the practice of planting crops with enough space between each other so that they can grow properly. Minimum spacing requirements are usually what's given. Stratification, the process of pre-treating dormant seeds to simulate the natural conditions that they need in order to germinate at a high rate. Transplanting. The process of moving plants from one location to another, such as small plugs or starters, to their final home in your garden. Fertilization. The induction of flowering, bud formation, or bulb formation of a biennial or perennial plant by exposing it to a chilling period, usually winter. Weeds. Any plant species growing where it's neither intended nor wanted. Many weeds can be beneficial, however. Wet feet. 
A conditioned in plants where drainage is poor and standing water replaces air, causing the soil to go anaerobic and the plants to suffer. As exhausting as that list was, it is by no means exhaustive. If you guys can think of any terms that'll help your fellow grower, please leave it in the comments down below. All right, now that we speak the lingo, let's look at some of the essential tools that we're gonna need to start growing. The truth is, we don't need anything. You can grow plants just fine without investing in any hardware at all. However, Tools do make gardening life a heck of a lot easier. So here's my top five list of gear to get your grow on. Regardless of the size of your garden, the most efficient tool at moving dirt is a shovel of some sort. And for growing veggies in your backyard, that would be a trowel. These mini shovels make short work of any planting job by digging the perfect holes for our starter plants and moving the soil to pack them in. Sowing seeds, adding amendments, even harvesting. You name it, trowels can do it. Next up, we have our cutting tools. Just as a trowel or small scoop is to digging, a pair of hand pruners is to cutting. You're gonna use these guys to prune the thick branches of fruiting plants such as raspberries, blueberries, and grapes, as well as cutting down the vigorous crops like corn and your spent peppers and tomatoes. Keep them clean and sharp, and a good set of pruners will last you your entire gardening life. Keeping up with the cutters, if you can swing it, I do like to have a finer pair of scissors. Use these guys for the more delicate jobs, such as trimming and harvesting your herbs. You can even get away with a Ooh. nice sharp pair of office scissors. The plants don't mind. Gardening is dirty work sometimes, and normally I don't mind getting my hands a bit dirty. But a pair of gloves can come in handy. especially when you're pruning some of those prickly plants or even a little protection from the cold. A good set of gloves is never a bad idea. Lastly, one versatile tool that I have no trouble splurging on is a hard rake. Although I try not to disturb my soils too much, a hard rake to tamp down the area for level seeding or to dig even rows for your carrots or beets is made much easier with a hard rake. They aren't crazy expensive and they should last you a long, long time. Okay, we can now talk like a gardener and we have all the tools necessary. Time to start planting, right? Wrong. Growing plants to the point where you can harvest and eat them consistently and reliably is all about timing, especially if you live in an area with defined seasons. Planning out your crops is essential so that they're growing in the window of opportunity that they're designed to take advantage of. You can't grow peppers in the winter if your climate dips below 60 degrees Fahrenheit or 15 degrees Celsius. And if you have a really hot summer, you should wait for cooler days for your lettuces and kale. Every single crop has an ideal window of time to grow, and that window of time is different for every climate. You may see a ton of videos and posts online showing people planting tomatoes in January, but if you live in a climate like mine, even in the greenhouse, Tomatoes can't be planted until March or April. Knowing these windows will help you prepare ahead of time and give you a clearer idea of when to plant and when you can expect to harvest. It may be cold and miserable outside, but the great thing about gardening is that there's always something to do. So brush up on your gardening terminology, look at acquiring any tools that you may need for the coming season and start planning your planting timelines based on your climate and the crops you wanna grow. All right, that covers the three T's of gardening basics. And in video number two, we're gonna cover the three S's, soil, seeds, and spacing. Should be a good one. Growing a successful garden is often like following a recipe, an order of operations where each subsequent step relies on the one previous. And just like your favorite dishes that have more than one recipe, 
gardening is the same and that there's more than one way to grow a crop. Therein lies the confusion for the beginner gardener that's just starting out. Mountains of information and not enough experience to decipher it all. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms and welcome to part two of the four part series, Growing Your First Garden. A set of videos where we help new growers plan and plant for the first time from water to nutrients and flowers to fruit. Today is all about the three S's, soil, seeds, and spacing. If you haven't checked out part one of this series, here's the link right here. If you have, let's get started. As a new gardener, you'll find out pretty quickly that soil is quite literally the foundation for healthy plants. Beyond the obvious of supplying support for the roots of our crops, soil is the engine that powers the entire garden. Everything good that happens in our garden starts with our soil. Think of it as a giant grocery store for our plants. It's where they get their food, water, and oxygen to complete every single life process. And there's this direct correlation between a healthy soil and healthy plants. Many veteran growers adopt the motto, grow and feed your soil so that it can grow and feed your plants. What this means is a healthy, active, functioning soil profile will in turn support greater plant growth and require little to no extra chemical additives. Soil is a non-renewable resource. It can take a lifetime to build up or it can be lost in a single season. With such importance bestowed upon it, here's four ways to cultivate and maintain the healthiest soils possible. The first thing you want to do is to always be amending it. And the number one resource to amend your soils with is compost. Compost is a wonder product, provided you have the space to make it. Adding compost to your soil throughout the year has many benefits, but four really stick out. Compost is gonna help to improve your soil's drainage while simultaneously improving the moisture retention. And when you think about it, this is an amazing cycle of opposed functionality. Third, your compost is gonna return a wide range of nutrients back to your soil, so much so that some growers use compost as their sole source of fertilizer. Lastly, soil as a complex web of activity is only as strong as its micro-inhabitants. Soil microorganisms are essential in the cycle of nutrients, taking them from not available to our plants to available. These microorganisms are also protectors. They protect our plants from disease and from harmful fungal outbreaks. Not only that, they can even purify the soil. Compost is teeming with all levels of life and the inoculation of your garden with it supercharges your soil and in turn your plants. Okay, the next way to cultivate a healthy soil is to protect it. And universally, the most common way to do this is to mulch. Nature readies itself for the harshest conditions every fall by shedding its foliage and forming a protective layer, fully encapsulating its top layers of soil. This is by design and without fail. Same thing with your garden. A heavy thick mulch layer is gonna preserve moisture, prevent compaction, eliminate erosion, add organic matter, and even some nutrients. There's no doubt about it. From now until the end of time, a mulch soil is a healthy soil. Mulch a step further, we can grow cover crops. Cover crops are living mulches, fast growing plants, often grasses, that are grown over times of dormancy in our garden. They do everything a mulch does, but even better. Their protection is unmatched, and when given a choice between mulching and growing a cover crop, I'm always gonna pick a cover crop. Do bear in mind that while you can and should always mulch your vegetables, cover plants are only grown in the absence of your garden crops. So in the grand scheme of a modern backyard garden, there's a place for both. And the final way that I protect and cultivate the soils of my garden is to not use chemicals or synthetics. In the rare case that my soils need extra nutrients, 
I'll always add slow release amendments instead. I use compost and cover crops for weed suppression instead of herbicides. And I minimize the soil disturbance by practicing no-till and no-dig farming wherever possible. Your soil is going to be your biggest ally to growing the best fruits and veggies. Protect and cultivate it, and you'll see the results every season. Okay, soil is a biggie, and we could talk about it for hours. For more in-depth soil-related videos, though, I'll leave a ton of links down in the description. The next S is for seeds. Every crop we grow, other than the few we grow from cuttings, starts their life cycle as a seed. Whether we direct sow or start the seeds early indoors and then transplant, the seed is the beginning of the crop. And one of the great things about our modern world is the seed packet. These things are filled with all the information, in a generic sense, that you need to grow the potential crop inside. When to plant, how deep to plant, exposure, time to harvest, all that stuff. While it's not everything a beginner needs to know to grow the crop, in my opinion, it's a good starting point. I've done a whole video just on decoding seed packets. Check it out right here. All right, as a new grower, your two biggest things you need to figure out for a crop is gonna be whether or not you direct sow your seeds or pre-start them indoors, and when is the right time to plant. The local climate that you live in is likely gonna dictate and make these choices for you, but certain situations could arise that change your plans. Take herbs, for example. When I'm growing them outdoors, I often pre-start my herbs like arugula, cilantro, dill, and basil, and then I transplant them once they're established. Indoors, however, there's simply no need for this transitory step. If I'm growing my herbs indoors over winter, I'll simply direct sow them into their final pots because they grow so fast, and transplanting is completely unnecessary. Also, some plants are either too troublesome to transplant, such as carrots or beets, while others grow so quick, transplanting seems to be a waste of time, like corn or peas. It's all about finding what works best for you, the plants, your climate, and the situation. And how about the seeds themselves? Well, think of them as tiny dormant vessels waiting to explode with life. And all seeds, regardless of the variety of plant, need two things to accomplish this. Moisture and heat. You'll find that pretty much all seeds germinate at the most efficient rate between 75 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit, even if they're a cold weather plant. So keep this in mind when both direct seeding and pre-planting indoors. As for moisture, water is the unlock that actually facilitates germination itself. Through a process known as imbibition, the seeds absorb water, expand, and the seed coats crack. Food for the seed, as well as enzymes, become hydrated and activated, and the germination process begins. For most of our crops in the ideal temperature range, this process takes around a week or less. But while seeds in a dormant state seem pretty protected, they actually don't last forever. They all have a shelf life, and some seeds last longer than others. Whenever you're troubleshooting potential germination problems, always check your conditions first. But even if you follow all the steps and do everything perfectly, you can still get crops that disappoint. Although it's not super common, it's not unheard of to have unviable seed. The solution to this is to test your seeds, and it's actually quite simple. You can test for seed viability right at home by placing a small sample set of the seeds in damp paper towel for about one to two weeks. At temperature slightly above room temperature, you'll know soon enough if the seeds themselves are the problem. No doubt it's a slight annoyance to have unviable seed, even if you catch it early. But if you find out much later, well, it's more than annoying as you might just miss that window for that crop entirely. Okay, that's seeds in a nutshell. Direct sowing versus transplanting and ensuring that the seeds are viable. Solve those two questions and you're golden. Okay, now we have spacing. Plants need room to grow. And no two plants are the same. Even though that garlic is closely related to these green onions, look at the difference in their spacing. But no matter what, plants need room, both for the foliage above and for the network of roots down below. 
Although there's always room to tweak and experiment, the spacing requirements for all of our crops are known and documented. There's no need to reinvent the wheel here. Now, despite this, one trick growers often do when they're direct seeding certain varieties of plants is they'll sow more seeds than is necessary. It's only for certain crops, but it's on purpose. And it's to ensure that there's enough germinated plants for the given space. What ends up happening is that the plants are thin later on, a few weeks after germination, to the required spacing. We see it in beets, carrots, and even corn. For young transplants that you pre-started somewhere else, usually the adult spacing needs are observed right away. Now, this does result in a rather bare looking garden initially. This is normal. Don't be tempted to fill in the empty gaps. Within a few weeks, the plants are gonna grow into the space. If you plant in the empty spots, quickly your garden will be crowded and none of the plants are gonna have the adequate spacing. It's a common first time mistake and I see it all the time. Observe the spacing rules for each plant and you'll be just fine. Now, there are times when you can plant close together and the crops won't compete with each other. You can intersperse crops that have different patterns of foliage as well as varying root depths with great success. Grow something like peas, carrots, and tomatoes together, or grow basil among your pepper plants. You can also stagger the rows of defined plants like lettuce and zucchinis so that there's more efficient use of space. Get creative. Just keep in mind that overcrowded plants will most likely not produce as well. With your soil, your seeds, and your spacing all figured out, the concept of your first garden is beginning to take shape. And as the puzzle pieces start to fall into place, the mystery surrounding how to successfully grow a garden becomes less and less. Rolling into video three, we'll switch our focus to the three Ps of gardening. Plants, planting, and patience. We'll continue to build on what we've covered so far. It should be a good one. No question the main focus of gardening is the plants themselves. The goal, the outcome, the reward. Fruits of our labor for correctly providing the right environment at the right time. No doubt all we've talked about up to this point has been important. Because I believe achieving that baseline of knowledge is really going to help us. Especially if this is our first time growing a garden. But now, it's time to get into the plants. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms. And welcome to part three of the four part video series, Growing Your First Garden. Today's exciting because it's all about the three P's of gardening. Plants, planting, and patience. There's a lot to cover as always, so let's get into it. Taking our time up to this point and forming that foundation of knowledge is super important, both for clarity and understanding. Without knowing the importance of soil, how seeds germinate and grow, the tools we need to cultivate, and the timing of it all, we're left in a cloud of mystery that makes gardening seem impossible. So while the previous two videos have been necessary, now is when the action starts, when the theoretical gets put into motion and we can start growing. Every plant we grow as a food crop has a price. A real set of costs in terms of soil, water, nutrients, sunlight, and time. Some plants like lettuce and kale are cheap. Others like eggplants and watermelon are very expensive. And what I mean by this is the inputs of resources and time are significantly less to grow something like say lettuce or spinach than it is to grow something like a tomato or pepper. So when you're picking the crops to grow in your garden for the first time, Obviously start with your favorites. You only want to grow what you want to eat. Past that, we have to look at what's involved to grow the crop to harvest and whether it's worth the time and effort involved. This usually becomes more of a question for temperate growers with smaller windows of warm weather. If you can grow tomatoes and peppers year round because you live in Florida, that's great. But if you live further north like I do and your summer is finite, long growing fruiting crops may not be the best choice. Again though, it's a choice. Always grow what excites you and don't let anybody tell you that you can't grow something. 
Just keep it in the back of your mind and be aware that some crops are more efficient and economically viable than others. There's a million different ways to categorize all the different crops we can grow, both generally and scientifically. But the easiest way is by crop type. First, decide whether the crop you want to grow is an annual. Plants you need to keep planting every year. Or is it a perennial? Plants that live three or more years. Perennial plants like this rosemary here usually have a higher initial cost. Not only that, they usually take a bit longer to get started. However, once they do get going, they continue to provide bounty for multiple seasons. Think of them as long-term investments. It's the annuals though that make up the bulk of our garden plantings. And I like to divide those guys into three categories, all based on the harvest. Roots, like beets, carrots, and potatoes. Shoots, like lettuce, spinach, and herbs. And fruits, our tomatoes, peppers, zucchinis, etc. The crops that are easiest to grow with the fastest rate of return and the lowest amount of inputs are your shoot crops. Think about it. If you're just growing the crop for foliage, you can harvest them pretty much at any time. Not only that, if harvested correctly, you can often get multiple cuttings of the same plant. Even still, multi-harvesting aside, in terms of just the time involved, you can often grow a shoot-only crop like lettuce or spinach two, sometimes three times successfully in the same window of time it takes a fruiting crop to grow. Shoot crops can be grown outdoors in the summer, indoors in the winter, direct seeded, or from transplants. All else being equal, they're the easiest, most economical crops to grow. And with that shorter life cycle, less is likely to go wrong. And with just a foliar harvest, you're almost always guaranteed a bounty to show for your efforts. Roots and fruits are going to be the next level. Depending on where you live and what crops you choose to grow, they may be direct seeded, or you could need a head start, and transplanting may be required. Everyone's list of crops that they can grow is going to vary slightly. If you're like me, you'll be starting your peppers, cucumbers, and tomatoes early so that they have enough time to flower and produce during the short summer. You see, I need to get them in the ground as eight-week-old plants in the spring, not as seeds. I'm in zone nine, which is quite mild, and there still isn't enough time for those guys to complete their life cycle. But my winters are mild enough that I can direct sow my carrots and beets up to three times a year. And something as fast growing as sugar snap peas, upwards of four times. As you can see, it's all about the climate and plant selection. While gardening is all about the plants, and rightly so, how we grow them plays the biggest part in our success. As we talked about, there's two ways to plant a crop, either by direct seed or by pre-started plants. Further to that, we can either grow in the ground or raised beds or in containers and pots. So that gives us four ways to plant our crops. There's nuances to each one, so let's go over them so that there's no surprises when you're planting your first garden. The term container gardening is a bit of a misnomer. Yes, we're growing the plants in a confined space, but the potential has far less boundaries than you'd think. Many growers are gonna be restricted to pots and containers simply because of space issues. Living in an apartment or condo will preclude these gardeners from large raised beds or unlimited rows of crops. There'll be more than a few of you container gardening exclusively, and that's okay. In fact, more than okay, because amazingly, almost every crop can be grown in containers. If you get a chance, check out my top 10 list of patio crops to grow right here, and you'll see what I mean. With the right soil, container size, and sunlight hours, no crop is off the table. You can direct sow containers, or you can employ transplants. Watering can become an issue as containers drain far faster and they lose moisture at a greater rate compared to a traditional plot setup. But there are workarounds to that and it's not a deal breaker. In addition to that list of patio plants, I'll throw a ton of links down below to specific crops designed for container gardening. These videos detail the crop every step of the way. 
you'll see that no plant is off limits. So don't feel that you're being left out if you don't have a huge backyard or acres of land. Okay, that was a bit of a rant on container gardening, but it was an important discussion. Let's switch gears and talk about direct seeding versus transplanting and the techniques involved. Direct seeding is easy, probably the most straightforward way to planting a crop. And there's two ways to physically direct seed. One is to dig a little trench, place the seeds inside, and then cover them back up. The other, which is what I like to do, is to sow the seeds directly onto the surface of your garden and then cover them with a skim coat of soil. Cover them with enough to simulate the desired planting depth and you're done. Now, not all seeds are planted at the same depth, so make sure to check the seed packet for that crop's particular requirements. Also, as we mentioned before, some crops are overseeded to compensate for germination issues and then thin later. On the other end of the spectrum, we have crops like corn and peas that are simply single seeded. One trick though that some gardeners like to do if seed viability is in question for those crops is to double or triple seed them, and as long as one germinates, you're gonna be okay. Thin to the strongest plants a couple weeks after they sprout, and then carry on like normal. Transplants like this winter lettuce are much more straightforward when it comes to planting. The suggested adult spacing for pre-started plants is observed right away, right when you plant them. And with their big head start, planted right when the weather warms up, they grow like crazy. However, there's two key things you need to know when dealing with pre-started plants. Those that are coming from indoors must be acclimatized to the harsher conditions outside. We call this hardening off. The sun, wind, temperature, exposure, it's all different and much more severe than the cushy conditions of inside. Bring the plants out for a few hours every day over the course of a week or two to condition the plants properly. Second, no matter how tough and hardy the crop is, Try to transplant on calm, overcast days. Never transplant on windy days, nor in the heat of the sun, if possible. Give the plants the best chance at getting established. Starter transplants are big business, and you can buy them every spring. They're available everywhere, and the prices are pretty reasonable. Variety is often limited, however, whereas seed packets are not. So I always choose to make my own. For those plants requiring a long growing time, you'll want to start your seeds early indoors around six to eight weeks before that last spring frost date. Again, that date is going to be different for everyone and it's dependent on where you live. Regardless, you want to give the plants a good head start. We want to get them really established, but not too lush and overgrown. If you're doing a few plants, paper cups or small pots work just fine. You can even make homemade mini biodegradable pots from paper towel rolls as well. Anything that holds soil and drains water will work. Now, once you really get into it and you're doing a variety of plants, you'll find that the professional nursery plug trays work the best. They're a perfect size to get most plants a good shoot system with a supportive set of roots. But whatever you choose, make sure it holds soil and drains water. Okay, as we said before, most seeds germinate best between a range of 80 and 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Indoors, this usually isn't a problem. In this range, most seeds are gonna germinate in around a week to 10 days. Make sure you have adequate light because without it, the plants go looking for it. They'll grow long and leggy and that's not what we're after. LED lights do work the best and compared to just a few years ago, they're quite inexpensive. But you know what's even cheaper? The sun. A nice sun facing window can grow you all the seedlings you want. And before I had LED light setups, I grew thousands of plant seedlings to transplant into my garden. So spending money is not always necessary, nor the best option. As for nutrients, one or two feedings of a dilute liquid organic feed should be enough. Once at around three weeks of age, and then again a few weeks later. Many people, myself included, move their transplants along to larger pots around a month or so. If that's the case, you can skip the liquid feeding altogether and just use a rich potting mix 
to sustain your young plants. Minimize those inputs to maximize your garden profits. So, plenty of light, don't overwater, and start them with enough time so that the plants are well established in time for that spring planting. <laughs> okay, okay. Exciting stuff, right? Maybe a little too exciting, which brings us to our final P, and that's patience. Patience on two fronts. One, not to start too early, and two, not to take on too much. Even as I'm talking about it right now, I want to go seed all of my tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, eggplant, zucchini, carrots, beets, squash, chard, all of it. But for my area, it's just not time yet. You really have to think about your planting windows for your climate zone. Be mindful of the growing timelines for each crop and be strategic in your planting. Don't bite off more than you can chew, especially in your first season. Try a few potted plants, try a couple direct seeders, and hey, try your hand at the more elaborate fruiting crops. Get a feel for how each plant type grows and build off that experience. Gardening is a lifelong journey. And if you're just starting out, enjoy the process and absorb what it teaches you. All right, that was a big one with lots of important concepts. Hopefully by this point, you can visualize your garden all coming together. And you feel that confidence growing as we get closer to planting time. And we're nearing the home stretch. In the next video, the final in the series, we'll end on the three H's of gardening. Happy, harvesting, and health. Hope to see you there. Growing a fruitful garden, there's nothing better. The cultivation of our favorite crops in anticipation of a harvest. We can watch the seemingly endless videos of people harvesting unreal bounty, making it look so easy. And sometimes it is. Sometimes everything just clicks and the plants thrive, producing even better than you could have hoped for. But not always. From time to time, things are gonna go wrong. Sometimes it's our fault directly, and often it's our fault for things that we've done along the way, indirectly. Hi, I'm Jeff from the Ripe Tomato Farms, and welcome to part four, the final video in our series, Growing Your First Garden. And today, we'll talk all about harvesting our favorite crops, no doubt, but more importantly, how do we actually get there? So this video is all about happy, harvesting, and healthy. And as it's the culmination of our four part beginner series, I just want to thank you guys so much for watching. And hopefully we've all learned a thing or two along the way. Like we touched on in part three, some plants are easier to get to harvest than others. Crops harvested for just their foliage, such as lettuces, spinach, herbs, and kale, are almost always able to provide at least some harvest, making them not only great for beginner planters, but also necessary crops for all gardens. And this is because they allow us to harvest throughout the year, pulling bounty from the garden at regular intervals instead of all at once. True gardening nirvana, however, happens when those leafy crops support multiple harvests. And then on top of that, the longer fruiting favorites pile on at the end to make the rewards even bigger. And to achieve that kind of harvesting, that level of production just in our backyard means we need to keep the plants happy. And so far, we're on the right path. We've talked about proper planting techniques, timing of both direct seeding and transplanting, as well as early seed starting and soil building. But to continue that trajectory and to keep our plants healthy and functioning all the way up until harvest, this is where we really earn our stripes. So here's five things that we can do during the growing season to make sure our plants stay happy. We do our job so that they can do theirs. Soil is the foundation for each crop's success. It's often also the source of unhappy plants and it's the first place I look when a crop begins to fail. Extreme pH swings, too wet, poor drainage, poor aeration. These are all things that'll manifest themselves 
into subpar growing. If the environment isn't right, then neither are the plants. So build your soils. Like we said in part two, grow your soil so that it can grow your plants. And here's a few ways to do that. First, try not to till or rotivate the top layers of soil. You really want to minimize that disturbance. Treat your soil profile like it's a living organism. Second, avoid walking on your garden directly. You really want to eliminate compaction in the garden. Air gaps within the soil are more important than you can possibly imagine. Next, chop and drop spent plants and crops to add some organic matter back into the soil, as well as to protect it. Also, inoculate your garden with compost and not just for the nutrients. Remember, compost is just teeming with life at the micro level. And finally, employ cover crops in the off seasons to keep that soil web functional and active. Take care of your soil. It's the single most important component of your garden. All right, number two on our list of keeping our plants happy is mulching. Mulch is like a suit of armor for your garden. Wonderful organic multifunctional armor that'll protect your soil and plant roots from temperature extremes, drought, freeze thaw action, heavy precipitation, weed outbreaks, and exposure. Mulch is the single easiest, most effective way to raise your garden to the next level. You'll quickly learn that exposed soils can become dead soils. Nature designs soil to be covered at all times, in all seasons. And you'll find that exposed soils just take matters into their own hands, and that's when you get an explosion of weeds. Bare soil is like a blank canvas, and weed seeds are the paint. They'll quickly fill in every available space as soon as the water and light hit them. It's just the nature of weeds, and a thick layer of mulch is your single biggest tool to combat this. Mulch with straw, grass clippings, shredded leaves, or even with the spent plants themselves, using the chop and drop method. Even seeded rows of your carrots, beets, lettuce greens, and radishes can be lightly mulched with a fine straw or some loose grass clippings. Anything to cover that bare soil. Not only that, your mulch is gonna add some organic matter back to your soil profile. Not to mention some nutrients in the case of grass clippings or other green mulches. Once you plant, your next step is the mulch, even before the first watering. And speaking of watering, No single activity generates more questions than when and how often should I water. Unfortunately, there is no answer. Nobody can actually tell you how often to water. The answer is different for every climate, region, soil type, crop, and time of year. It's impossible to answer, yet it's the number one question. Frustrating, right? Well, there are a couple of watering tips that'll make sure your plants stay in that happy zone. First is the time of day. Morning is the best time to water your plants, followed by afternoon, followed by evening. Let me explain. Watering in the morning sets up the plants for the day, when most of the action is going to happen. Less water is going to evaporate when it's cooler out, and the plants will be sure to have available moisture for the heat of the day. Afternoon watering can see a lot of moisture loss to immediate evaporation, so it's not really the most efficient. But on those really hot days, it's better than nothing. Evening should be avoided as a lot of water is lost to drainage overnight. As well, a wet, cool garden is ripe for fungal outbreaks and possibly rot. And speaking of watering your plants, water the roots, not the leaves. It's the roots that use the water, so make it available to them instead of blasting the foliage. And when you do water, really soak the garden thoroughly and deeply. Avoid infrequent shallow waterings. You want to train those roots to expand and go downwards. Shallow rooted crops are much more susceptible to drought and exposure than plants with deep elaborate root systems. Even more than the actual planting and harvesting, watering your plants gives you the most interaction with your garden. Take care to do it properly. And what about us container gardeners, where it feels like we're watering every day in the summer? How do we deal with that? It's tough because you know the plants need water and the pots themselves don't hold on to nearly as much of it as say a raised garden bed. Not only that, 
they lose much more water in the heat of the day. But in direct conflict with this, every time you water, it flushes the soil of both organic matter and nutrients. That's both costly and inefficient. Well, one trick the pros use to solve this is to water from below. Simply place your potted plant into a tub of water for a few hours and let it soak up as much water as it needs. It really works and it saves not only time, but also money in that you don't have to constantly fertilize. All right, back to the dirt. One way to supercharge your soils and thus your plants is to amend it. Now, this is a little bit different than outright fertilizing because it's more of a slow release, soil-based focus rather than a hard hit of liquid or chemical nutrients. Amend the soil with things like alfalfa meal, canola meal, rock dust, rock phosphate, and of course your compost. These slow release additives will feed both your soil and your plants over time. And that's going to ensure that the natural nutrient cycles are operating at a high efficiency and with maximum effect. And it's not just the current crop. Amending and building your soil this way will have profound effects on future crops. And you'll find that unlike big agriculture, your soil will get better and healthier over time, resulting in those happy plants that we're after. And the fifth way to ensure happy plants is to give them their space. Allow the roots the room they need to support the plant and give the foliage the space to flourish and grow to their full potential. No doubt as you get more experience, you'll experiment with some companion planting and more elaborate groupings of crops. But for now, keep it simple. Observe proper spacing for the best results. All right, the whole point of a garden is to get that delicious harvest, right? All those crunchy carrots, those plump tomatoes, the crisp lettuce, and the sweet, sweet peppers. There's nothing like it, and it makes all the effort so, so worthwhile. Now, every plant has its ideal window to harvest. Some are larger than others. For instance, while immature baby carrots are so delicious and super sweet, green peppers have a fraction of the nutrients of the fully ripened ones. Which, side note, is a shame, because I really, really like green peppers. Anyway, beside the point. While a vine-ripened tomato is a thing of beauty, your zucchinis are better picked immature, as the larger they get, the more difficult they are to eat. And on top of that, some plants are going to ripen off the plant, like tomatoes and peppers, and others will not, like watermelons or strawberries. And just to add to the confusion, some crops are going to keep in store for months, like onions, garlic, and even potatoes. Others, like herbs and lettuce, should be used immediately. Heck, even a robust crop like corn is best eaten within hours of picking. Who would have thought that? Each plant is different and unique in terms of its harvest. And if you've taken the time to successfully grow these crops right to the end, it only makes sense that you maximize the bounty you get from them. Couple of quick tips though. Try to harvest early in the morning for maximum longevity of your produce. And try to use two hands when you are harvesting as you don't want to damage the plants because there could be more fruit coming. Speaking of that, harvesting often begets more harvesting. What I mean by this is, for some plants, the more you harvest, the more your plants are going to produce. Herbs such as basil and dill will regrow stems and branch out with even more foliage with each subsequent harvesting. Crops like peppers will put more energy into the remaining fruit after an initial harvest, which is very handy to speed up ripening. Same with tomatoes. And if you're lucky and you grow more than you can immediately eat, look to freeze, dry, preserve, or make into your favorite sauces to maximize the use of the crop. Harvesting and efficiently using the plants you grow can be as tricky and nuanced as the growing itself. It's rewarding, no question, but a little bit of thought and planning at harvest time means you'll be enjoying your garden to the fullest. Which brings us to our final point on growing a garden, the effort involved and the effect that it can have on us. Once you get started and really catch the bug, this becomes a little more obvious. Gardening is what I would call a healthy hobby, in more ways than one. There's no doubt that spending time outside is good for the body and the mind. Stress, anxiety, boredom, depression, it can all be helped and lessened by being outdoors, either in nature or in your own greenscape. 
But I really think it goes deeper than that. Even the multi-generational shared experiences with our children, our parents, or even our grandparents, as amazing as they are, can be just the surface of what growing a garden can offer you. It can be an escape beyond deadlines, perfectionism, and the paralyzing control-focused tasks that inundate our every day. You quickly learn that nature can't be controlled or pigeonholed, and the acceptance of this is a perfect release. It's a stress relief even when things go bad. It really teaches you to roll with the punches, not to get too high in the good times, which helps you moderate the bad times. An even keeled sort of zen that's very, very hard to find these days. Add in the exercise, stress relief, and the yielding of the freshest, healthiest foods you'll ever eat, gardening can be like a fountain of youth. Feeling better, eating better, and living better. That's what it's all about. If this is your first time growing a garden, I wish you all the success this year. There will be ups, and there's going to be downs. Even in the worst cases, you'll gain invaluable knowledge that can only be found through experience. And in the best cases, well, you'll see why growing a garden was one of the best choices you ever made. Hey guys, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for taking the time to join me as we touch on the foundational points to starting your first garden. It's a lot to absorb, I know. So I hope you'll revisit the videos throughout the year as you begin your growing journey. And as you do get planting and start to grow, check out my specific videos on individual crops for more in-depth information. Happy growing, guys. Hey, thanks so much for watching, guys. I appreciate the support more than you know. And if you're getting value from these videos, please like and share them to spread the word and help your fellow gardener to grow better.